This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a phone conversation between an estate agent and a woman wishing to rent accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to 10. Fairfield Rentals, Andrew Williams. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm calling from the UK. Um, my family are moving to Canada early next year, and we're hoping to find somewhere to rent in Fairfield for the first six months while we settle in. Right. I see. Well, let's get your details. Yes, my name's Jane Ryder. OK, Jane. And can I have a phone number? The best number to get you on. Well, that'd probably be our home number. So, 0044 for the UK, and then it's 208 613 2978. All right. And an email address, please, so we can send you out all the information and forms. I think it's best if I give you my husband's email. He's sitting in front of a computer all day, so he can print stuff off and get it back to you sooner than I could. It's richard at visiontech.co.uk. I'll just spell the company name for you. That's V I S I O N. T E C H. Great. And we have a question here about occupation. Richard's an IT specialist for an advertising company. They're transferring him to their Fairfield branch. Actually, just your job for now, thanks. Me? I'm a doctor at the hospital in our town. OK, I'll put that down. Now, what kind of accommodation are you looking for? House? Apartment? An apartment, probably, as long as it has two bedrooms. There'll be me, my husband, and our ten-year-old son. And so with an apartment, you're less likely to get a garden. That's OK. But what about a garage? Is that something you'll want the apartment to have? Yes, that's definitely important. OK, just a moment. I'll just make a note of that. But uh, before we go on, I should probably say now that what we don't need is any furniture because we'll be shipping all that over and I don't really want to pay for storage while we're waiting to buy a house. Not a problem. I'll make a note of that. Actually, though, 
Just thinking about the kitchen, what can I expect from a rental property? I mean, what kind of equipment is provided? Well, the normal thing is that you get a stove. I think that's a cooker in British English. Okay, good to know. But how about a fridge? We'll be selling ours before we come, so if possible, we'd like the apartment to have one for when we arrive. I can certainly add that to the form. If there's any other whiteware that you need, like a dishwasher, for example, there are plenty of stores here that'll arrange delivery on the same day as purchase. Thanks. Hopefully, we won't need to buy too many things. Now, how about location? Have you done any research into the Fairfield area? Not that much so far. Well, you mentioned you have a boy. I imagine you'd like to be fairly close to a school. Good idea. That would help. What's public transport like in Fairfield? Is it easy to get around? The bus service is pretty comprehensive. There are plenty of local routes, services into the city, and out of town. Okay, and for a two-bedroom apartment. What sort of rent should we expect to pay? Well, looking at the properties we have at the moment, prices start from around seven hundred and thirty dollars per month, and depending on the area, can go up to twelve hundred dollars. That's too much. Something halfway would be better. So, would your limit be, say, nine hundred and fifty dollars? I'd say so. Yes. Can I ask if you smoke or if you have any pets? No to both questions, but I do have one more request, please. Yes. Well, I've also been offered a job at Victoria General Hospital, and I suspect I'll be working nights occasionally. So what I really need from any apartment is for it to be quiet, so I can catch up on sleep if necessary during the day. Congratulations on the job offer. I'll add your request to the form. Well, what I'll do is compile a list of suitable properties for you and send them via email. Um, can I just ask, how did you hear about us? Obviously, not from our commercials. If you're living in the UK, actually, it was a friend of ours. He spent a few months in Fairfield a couple of years ago. And he pointed us in the direction of your website. Well, it's good to be recommended. So, what I'll do is. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a police officer giving advice on protection against local crime. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Well, good afternoon. 
I'm Constable James MacDonald, and as you may know, I'm the community police officer for the local area. That means that, as part of my job, I try to get out in the community as much as possible, talk to the people that live in this neighbourhood, people like yourselves, and make sure there's an effective level of communication between the public and the police. Hence the reason for this meeting. There have been several burglaries in the area in the last few weeks, and I'd like to talk about ways you can keep your home and property safe. So I'd suggest that a good way to start is by talking to your neighbours and exchanging contact details with them. This will allow you to get in touch immediately if there's anything suspicious happening next door. Then make sure you have a good discussion about the best course of action to take in case of emergency. Make sure everyone is clear about what to do and who to call. If you plan ahead, this will prevent uncertainty and even panic should anything happen later. Another thing that I would advise you to do is always leave your radio playing, even when you go out. And if you keep your curtains closed, burglars are less likely to try and break in because they can't be sure whether someone's home or not. Now, none of us want to be in the situation where we can't get into our own home, but do take time to think where the best and safest place is to leave your spare keys. Putting them under the doormat or anywhere near the front door is just asking for trouble. You'd be surprised how many people actually do this, and it makes life really easy for burglars. All these things will help keep your community safe and will cost you nothing. However, If you are going to spend some money, what I'd recommend more than anything else is that you invest in some well-made window locks for your house. This will give you peace of mind. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, moving on. Unfortunately, there's been an increase in the number of minor crimes and antisocial behaviour in the general area, and I want to talk about some specific prevention measures that are being proposed. First of all, the skate park. As you probably know, it's well used by younger people in our community, but unfortunately we're getting more and more reports of broken glass, making it especially dangerous for younger children. One possible solution here is to get rid of some of the trees and bushes around the park, making it more visible to passers-by and vehicles. If the vandals know they're being watched, this might act as a deterrent. As you will have heard, a couple of local primary schools have also been vandalised recently, despite the presence of security guards. The schools don't have the funds for video surveillance, so we need people in the neighbourhood to call their nearest police station and report any suspicious activity immediately. Please don't hesitate to do this. I expect most of you are familiar with the problems facing Abbotsford Street. It seems that no amount of warning signs or speed cameras will slow speeding drivers down. I'm happy to say, however, that the Council have agreed to begin work over the next few months to put in a new roundabout. What else? Oh yes, the newsagent and the gift shop on Victoria Street were both broken into last week, and although no money was taken, the properties have suffered some serious damage. Access was gained to these shops through the small alleyway at the back of the properties. 
It's dark, and as you can imagine, no one saw the thief or thieves in action. So we've been advising shop owners along there about what kind of video recording equipment they can have put in. We'll then be able to get evidence of any criminal activity on film. The supermarket car park is also on our list of problem areas. We've talked to the supermarket managers and council authorities, and we've advised them to get graffiti cleaned off immediately and get the smashed lights replaced. If you don't deal with this sort of thing at once, there's a strong possibility that the activity will increase and spread, and then it becomes. That is the end of part two. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a presentation they are going to give. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, Robert. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. I was just printing off some pages about food waste in Britain. Do you want to include Britain in the presentation? I thought we were concentrating on the USA. Well, it is a global problem, so I thought we ought to provide some statistics that show that. Fair enough. What did you find out? Well. I was looking at a British study from 2013. It basically concluded that 12 billion pounds worth of food and drink was thrown away each year, all of it ending up in landfill sites, over eight million tons, and that wasn't including packaging. An incredible amount. Yes, and they were only looking at what households threw away. So there's no information about restaurants and the catering industry, but one thing the study did investigate was the amount of milk and soft drinks that were wasted, and I think it was probably quite unique in that respect. Interesting, you know, in the other European reports I've read, there's one thing they have in common when they talk about carbon dioxide emissions. I know what you are going to say. They never refer to the fuel that farms and factories require to produce the food, and the carbon dioxide that releases. Exactly. We could really cut down on carbon emissions if less food was supplied in the first place. To my mind, the reports talk too much about the carbon dioxide produced by the trucks. That deliver the fresh goods to the shops and take the waste away. They forget about one of the key causes of carbon dioxide. Absolutely, if the reports are actually going to be useful to people, they need to be more comprehensive. Who do you mean by people? Well, the government, industries, people making television programs. Have you seen any documentaries about food waste? Not that I remember. My point exactly. These days, they all seem to be focusing on where your meat, fruit, and vegetables are sourced from. We're being encouraged to buy locally, not from overseas. That's probably a good thing, but I'd still like to see something about waste. Yes, it's the same with magazine articles. 
It's all about fat and sugar content, and the kind of additives and coloring in food, but nothing about how it reaches your table and what happens after it ends up in the bin. Well, we've only got fifteen minutes for this presentation, so I think we'll have to limit what we say about the consequences of food waste. What do we want to concentrate on? Well. I know some of the other presentations are looking at food and farming methods, and what they do to the environment. So I think we'll avoid that, and the fact that in some countries people can't afford the food grown on their own farms. That was covered last term. Okay, we don't want to repeat stuff. What concerns me above all else is that in a recession. Governments should be encouraging business to find ways to cut costs. Apparently, supermarkets in the USA lose about 11 percent of their fruit to waste. That's throwing money away. All right, we'll focus on that problem. It should get the others' attention anyway. Now, how do you want to begin the presentation? Let's not start with statistics, though. Because that's what everybody does. I agree. How about we give the other students a set of questions to answer about what they suspect they waste every day? I'm fine with that. Probably a better option than showing pictures of landfill sites. It'll be more personalized that way. All right. Now let's start. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Okay, shall we now have a look at the projects that different researchers and organizations are working on? For me, the project I really liked was the one at Tufts University. You know, where they've invented tiny edible patches to stick on fresh foods that show you what level of bacteria is present. And so, whether you can still eat it, it's a great idea, as it tells you if you need to hurry up and eat the food before it goes off. The other good thing about the patches is that apparently they'll be cheap to manufacture. Good. Then the other thing I thought was great was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology project. I hadn't seen that. Well, they've developed these sensors. That can detect tiny amounts of ethylene. Ethylene is the natural plant hormone in fruit that makes them turn ripe. Apparently, the researchers think that they can attach the sensors to cardboard boxes, and then supermarkets can scan the sensors with a portable device to see how ripe the fruit inside is. That's got to be a quicker way to check for ripeness. Than taking each box off the shelf and opening it. Definitely, and I thought that Lean Path was worth mentioning too. Their waste tracking technology means that caterers can see how much food is being wasted and why. That'll increase profits for them eventually. Yes, and did you read about zero percent? They've produced this smartphone application that allows restaurants to send donation alerts to food charities. The charities can then pick up the unwanted food and distribute it to people in need. In the long run, that'll definitely benefit poorer families in the neighborhood. No kid should go to school hungry. I agree, and I read that quite a few local governments in the USA. Are thinking about introducing compulsory composting in their states, so you can't put any food waste into your rubbish bins, just the compost bin. Well, I guess that means a bit more work for people. 
I mean, they have to separate the organic and inorganic waste themselves before they take it out to the compost bin. And you know how lazy some people are. But I guess if we all start composting, we'd be doing something positive about the problem of food waste ourselves, rather than relying on the government to sort it out. Having said that, not everyone has a garden. So that is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a lecture about Maori kite making. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, good morning, everyone. As you know, we've been looking at different kinds of art and craft that were practised by the Maori people of New Zealand, at least before the Europeans began to arrive in the 18th century. So, the focus of this lecture is kite making, how the kites were made, their appearance and the purposes they served. Well, Let's start with the way they were made. As with other Maori artistic traditions, kite making involved certain um, rituals. So, firstly, only priests were allowed to fly and handle the largest, most sacred kites. There were rules, too, for the size and scale of the kites that the priests had to follow, and during the preparation of both small and large kites, food was strictly forbidden. In terms of appearance, Kites were frequently designed in the image of a native bird, or a Maori god, and sometimes, perhaps less often, a well-known hero. You can imagine that when Maori first arrived in the new country, in New Zealand, it may have taken some time to find suitable materials for their kites. But, through trial and error, no doubt, they found plants and trees that provided bark and even roots that they could use to make the frames and wings of their kites. And after the frame had been constructed, the kite then had to be decorated. For this, the priests used long grasses, and these, when the kite was in the air, would stream along behind it. They also used a variety of feathers to add um, colour to their creations. Well... All this meant it was easy to see a kite in the sky, but you could also hear Maori kites. They could be quite noisy indeed, and this was because some priests liked to hang a long row of shells from the kite. You can imagine how they'd rattle and clatter in the wind, how they might completely capture your attention. As I said before, the most common image was probably a bird, and that's the same for other kite-making cultures but the kites were designed in particular shapes. So, there were kites that were triangular, rectangular, and also shaped like a diamond. And some of them were so large, it would actually require several men to operate them. Um, some of the kites were also covered in patterns, and to make these patterns, 
the Maori used different pigments of red and black, and these were either made from a charcoal base or from red-brown clay which had been combined with oil obtained from a local species of shark. Now, before I forget, if you have a chance, do visit the Auckland Museum, because they have the last surviving Birdman kite on display. This is the kind of kite that has a wooden mask at the top of the frame. It's a mask of a human head, and you can clearly see it has a tattoo and also a set of teeth. Quite impressive, and a good example of Maori craftsmanship and symbolism. Right, turning to the purpose and function of the kites, they certainly had multiple uses. Primarily, the flying of kites was a way of communicating with the gods, and when the kites rose into the air, the Maori used them to deliver messages, perhaps requesting a good harvest, good fortune in war, a successful hunting expedition. So these kites were incredibly valuable to a community, treasured objects that one generation would pass to the next. People would also fly kites for other reasons, for example, to attract the attention of a neighbouring village. This was done when a meeting was required between Maori elders. A convenient method, indeed. And finally, when it comes to war, there are traditional stories that describe how, when a Maori warrior found himself surrounded by his enemies, a kite could actually provide the possibility of escape. The kites were powerful enough to take a man up into the air, and for this reason, they could also be used to lower him into enemy fortifications, so that an attack could begin from the inside. Well. I'm happy to say there seems to be a revival and growing interest in kite making, and I. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.